Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ken Field. Ken is a permanently recovering academic from the UK with a bachelor's uh, in cartography and PhD in GIS. Ken uh, grew tired of faculty meetings and the incessant hunt for research funding. <laughs> I'm going to read it, Ken. <laughs> Ditched his 20-year academic career and moved to the US where he talks and writes about cartography, teaches map design, and makes maps at Esri in Redlands, California. Um, as a passionate educator, he helps people make better maps. Uh, he's the author of two award-winning books, Cartography and Thematic Mapping, both excellent, I can attest. Um, he's active on social media, served as a chair and now vice chair of the ICA, Map Design Commission. Uh, he's also served as editor of the Cartographic Journal for nine years and is on the editorial board of the International Journal of Cartography. He teaches a um, MOOC, an MOOC on cartography, which has so far uh, had over 200,000 participants. Co-founder of Mapry.org, uh, Ken snowboards reasonably well, plays, plays drums badly, <laughs> uh, and is a long-suffering supporter of his hometown Premier League football team, Nottingham Forest. Um, Ken's going to be discussing his map, um, uh, California Snowflakes, uh, the pun I think intended, um, which chronicles the record snowfall year we had here in California during the 2022-2023 uh, winter. Um, it's a beautiful map that hangs on the wall back there and reminds me every time I see it of how I was stuck in the mountains because all the roads were closed during the middle of that incredible snowstorm that we had here. So uh, welcome, Ken. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Um, since the summer's movie, um, a better bio for me is, is just Ken. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot shorter. Okay, right, uh, let's split the room. How many, of you how many of you go skiing? How many of you go snowboarding? Right, let's split the room. Okay, I'm a snowboarder. If you see some goofy guy on the slope falling over himself, um, with a topo lid, topo goggles, and a topo jacket. That's me. Stop. Please pick me up. And uh, off we go. Right. Um, maps. Let's talk maps. Um, actually, before I, I'm, I'm going to just say, I, I want to echo everybody else's thanks for this conference, all the facilitators, the organizers, David, Barry, everybody. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to be stood in front of this monstrosity. Ooh stood in front of this this monster screen presenting um so thank you thank you all um inspiration for maps can come from many many different places i think we've seen that in the presentations so far these last few days um, i think of a map as a mix of a historical context serendipity motive and many many other sort of factors that sort of weave their way into the design process in this presentation, what I'd like to do is touch on all of these. I'm going to take you um, on a sort of a slippery slope. And there's, there's going to be puns. On a slippery slope, uh, a journey, if you will, on a map of California's record snowfall of this last winter. I want to start with a little bit of context. Um, I won't dwell on these because these maps we've seen in the last few days pretty much. Um, the thematic mapping has a very long, a very rich, very varied history. These are examples from the 1800s, um, generally characterized by the inventions of various forms of thematic map types, data viz types, um, as, as we've seen in, in, in presentations so far. Um, we skip to the 1900s, again, maps we've seen in these last few days. Techniques weren't necessarily firsts anymore. Um, and, you know, if we're, if we're trying to establish the history of data visualization, we, we tend to focus on firsts. But if you look at some of these maps compared to the slides before, experimentation, iteration became much more prominent. Maps became artisanal. They had flair, they had style, and people were trying to establish ways of implementing techniques in different and varied and interesting eye-catching ways. Atlases and compendiums became commonplace. Um, towards the middle and the end of the century, computer graphics became increasingly used, which in some sense, in some senses, I felt, uh, moved quality backwards slightly. 
um, because computer assisted techniques needed to be developed and the way in which we develop them is searching for algorithms and automated workflows to replicate what went before. So there's naturally a step back before we then take a step forward. Taking that step forward to the 2000s, we start to begin to see more of a paper to screen revolution, more one-off pieces, the rise of data journalism and attention grabbing graphics, the rise of the slippy map, map-based services that put you at the center of the map, um, they are animated, they're interactive, they're scrolly telling, they're fed by live data feeds. Um, but by and large, most techniques are now fairly well established. True innovation is, is kind of hard to find, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all thematic maps are made equally. There's good, there's indifferent, there's not so good. And why should that be? I think in part, um, it's to do with how cartography has changed dramatically in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so where are we? Well, I actually think, to coin a phrase that we've used before this conference, we're in a, a new golden age of thematic cartography. The rapid rise of both the means to make the map and the data to make the map means that maps are being made. What is cartography? It's an art. It's a science, it's a technology. The science is reasonably well established through measurement, through cognitive science and so on. But a massive technological shift over the last half century or so has impacted not only who does cartography, but how. The art, as a consequence, I think has shifted. This white line down the middle, that's not an accident. That's when I graduated in a cartography degree, which is possibly the worst timing you've ever seen as GIS came along and killed what you might call as professional cartography. And all I mean there is folks that have a qualification in it. They've gone through college, they've got a bachelor's or a master's to differentiate them from in their domain from somebody in somebody else's domain. Um, so what did I do? Um, I went into teaching. So I began to teach cartography and teach map design because quite frankly, all of the techniques I'd learned in my degree were no longer relevant. Got to retool um, or die. Um, so I felt I should retool at the start of my career. Um, so ruling pens have been replaced by code. Online maps are in our pockets. Navigation is instant, it's interactive. Um, and many more folks now make maps um, than ever did before. And they're doing so in remarkably innovative ways. And now I've got this big screen, I'm just gonna go hands, hands rosling for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's Friday, come on. Um, but with development in one area comes kind of growing pains in another. And with technology at most people's disposal, as well as the data, there's now often, or I see, a race to make the right map, to make the map right, and to make the map fast. And getting that balance is a hard thing to do. Attention spans are less. Engagement is now a key metric for success. Um, we measure success in page views and in seconds now, as opposed to you know full um, analysis of work, if you like. Um, and the number of maps that fall in the center of this sweet spot that get everything nicely balanced, it's actually relative, relatively few, um, but there's an awful lot more maps out there. And so with that in mind, I think there's a growing need for education um, and tuition, not only in map design, but also in how to read and interpret and be critical about what you're seeing. Um, and we, with that in mind, and that's really the focus of my work, um, the job of this so-called professional cartographer, I think the thing has changed largely from those employed to turn someone else's ideas into reality. So Charles Sheffins drew the John Snow map, Heinrich Beran, painted Mary Tharp's Mid-Atlantic Ridge work. Different people lie behind the maps than you might necessarily assume. But I think we've moved to educators, helping people translate the work of their own domains into great visuals, either directly or through simply making work that other people can look at and be inspired by. So my job really over the last 35 years has gone from educator to a practitioner who educates. 
And I think there are subtle differences. I can't simply stand and tell people how to make maps anymore. It doesn't wash. Nobody will want to know that. But if I show them the map and then help them to understand how to get to the end product, um, that works. It's the old Chinese product um, um, prophecy, really, um, of you know, showing somebody and helping them teach them how to fish and they catch their own fish. It's the same principle. Um, and I think this reflects the growing need to provide makers and consumers with the graphical ability to approach map making with care and consideration. So I do that by writing books, blogs, how to's, creating resources, and crucially, making maps. So I'm going to focus on this one recent map I made, the California Snowflakes map. Uh, I'm going to explain the idea, the way it came about, the reasons it was made, and why I did it. And for that, um, I'll take you back to 2006. This is my vacation. This is the sort of silly stuff I do. Strap a GPS, take a little trimble with me. And um, yes, we're going down all the crazy runs that I wouldn't necessarily um, go down, but I need to complete my map. So I, I have to collect my GPS data, right? Um, but I like being in the snow mountain environments. <coughs> and um, this was a map I made of Breckenridge in the style of Harry Beck's schematic map. Um, I got to know James Niehus, the famous ski artist, when I made this map. Um, I wanted his opinion. Uh, it wasn't good, <laughs> but we became friends, and um, he thought it was an interesting idea, but it would never take off, and he was absolutely right. I knew he was absolutely right, and that's fine, but it was an experiment. <coughs> Fast forward to this past winter. This is my backyard in Redlands. It hardly gets any rain, let alone snow. This is my fire pit, which I call global warming. <laughs> and we, we got a dusting of snow, which meant that the mountains had an awful lot of snow. And to show you how uh, discombobulating it was, this is my dog, Wisley, who's like, why is the sky falling in? Um, always put a dog or a kitten in your presentation, <laughs> always. So as ever, circumstances go an awful long way to dictating what my next project might be and hooking into current affairs or events is a great invention, uh, and their imagination. Um, and, and that gives me teachable moments. That's what I'm looking to achieve. Um, so it provides current contextual aspects to try and teach something about map design. It's education by stealth. Um, somebody said, I think it was yesterday, um, about using the allure of a beautiful map in interesting ways, and that's what I try to do. I use the allure of a map to try to encourage people to think more about how to represent their own work. And it also gives you an opportunity to take pictures from your front yard of the local mountains that look absolutely stunning. So how might snowfall be more conventionally um, illustrated? This is the um, Californian Water Atlas from uh, about 1970, early 1970s, which is in the case over there. Um, it's in the Rumsey Collection. If you've never seen the California Water Atlas, I would thoroughly recommend it. It is full of really interesting, innovative, thematic depictions of all sorts of data. So this map has a, a well-balanced layout. It uses an isopleth, which is kind of the non-bounded version of a, a choropleth. Um, it's well-balanced. It's got useful graphs and charts occupying otherwise empty space. You know, that's one of the key tenets of cartography, make the whole layout kind of interesting. It provides additional data, it provides additional context. And this mix of maps and graphics and narration, I think has become a very well used mechanism for providing people with detail that they can reveal understanding from. Rather than just giving people a map and expecting them to interpret it um, in all its glory. Um, but as with any great map, it's the attention to detail, I think, that makes the sum of the parts really, really sing. It's got a hill shade on it, this thematic map. We very rarely see topographic detail on thematic maps. But in this context, it helps to embed this particular phenomena, the snowfall, which is mostly going to be at higher elevations. The small graphs that show percentage or precipitation falling as snow, 
this is all additional context and it's really fascinating. For me, it's the little tricks though. Look at the contour lines between the different classes on the isoplex. They, they differ between light and dark and light and dark. That's a really peculiar treatment to me, but I think it's an interesting, unique treatment that makes me want to look at this map in more detail, makes me want to go into the map and explore it. Okay, that was back in the 70s. A little bit more up to date, this is what the USGS uh, data science team did uh, this year, this winter, to look at data from 2001 to 2020. Um, but remember, this is a map that's now published by social media. It's not a fully fledged Atlas product. It's a smaller format. It needs to be simple. It needs to have been made in minutes or hours, not days or weeks or months. Um, and what they've done is hex binned their data. So they've looked at measurements within each of these sort of binned areas and applied a vector graphic to it, a snowflake, uh, which is consistent in size and shape, but which varies between white for high, heavy snowfall to sort of blue to fade into the background of the map um, to show lower snowfall. And I thought, well, that's, this is a really nice map. I like this map. But what if every snowflake was different? So I'm starting to think, think about ideas in my head. What if every snowflake on the map was a real snowflake? Hex bin data, um, binning the, bin data into standard shapes isn't new technique either. USGS didn't invent it, but who cares about who invented things? We can reuse, right? Reuse, repurpose, reinvent, um, and, and keep going with techniques, develop them. Um, this is from the Unification of London, The Need and the Remedy, written by John Layton in 1895. London split up into hexagons. The hatched shading is used according to proximity from the centre of the city. And it looks like Layton was proposing a wayfinding system for London based on each area's zonal shade. Well, we can take binning back to Dupin's uh, work in um, developing the choropleth technique. And binning really is just a general term for grouping a data set of n values into less than n discrete groups. Groups or bins can be spatial, temporal, attribute based. And really all they are is two dimensional histograms. That's, that's how we think of them. So the development of the hex bin really can be traced back, back to a 1987 paper by Dan Carr, but inspired previously by square gridded sunflower, flower, blah, sunflower plots not sunflower pots, sunflower plots, described a few years earlier by William Cleveland and Robert McGill. And here, each of the sort of petals on the um, diagram is a single data point within that bin. So you get a sense of density through this uh, aggregation of data in the bin. And Carr created on the right this kind of first hexagonal version. Um, why hexagons? Well, you can't tessellate using circles and exhaust space, but hexagons are just about the closest shape that does that. Six-sided shapes um, are the most efficient way of, of splitting space up in that manner. Okay, let's part that for a second. I've, I've got hexagons covered off. I kind of know where I'm going with it. This guy, let's go back to the snow. This, this guy's called Wilson Bentley, otherwise known as Snowflake Bentley. He was a meteorologist from Vermont um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but his side passion was photography, and not just normal photography, but micro photography. He took pictures, photographs of snowflakes. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether skiers and boarders amongst you have ever been sat on a chairlift and it's snowing and you look down in your dark jacket and these beautiful little crystals appear and it's a wonderful shimmering sort of experience. Um, he photographed them and he's took, taken over 5,000 of these photographs um, and he published them in various bound volumes. And wouldn't you know it, but the Natural History Museum in London, uh, England, recently digitized one of Bentley's publications and open sourced the content. Um, and I came across this and I'm looking through this scrapbook of, of um, snowflakes. And of course, it's like a light bulb. They're hexagons. Ooh. Okay. So timing's everything. Record snowfall, uh, the notion of creating a hex binned map, 
uh, sparked by the USGS map, and now real snowflakes. I just needed the data. Well, all of these kind of maps started appearing. The sort of map that I don't particularly care for, um, the projections a little bit wonky. Well, well, let's park that debate. The colours, I'm not even going to go there. But the key, <laughs> the key here is this is data. You can literally right click and download all of the data for snow accumulation from the National Weather Service, uh, the Weather Centre. <coughs> and that's fantastic. So I can now make the map, hopefully make it right, and I'm hopefully going to make it fast before somebody else has the same idea. So I get Bentley's snowflakes. I go through the digital versions of them. I pick out 100 that I really like. No other reason than I like them, and that's a perfectly good justification for doing anything. Um, and I went from full and fluffy to light and wispy, because what I wanted to do is eventually show hexagons that were fairly full of white snow and fairly empty when there was low accumulation. So I'm already thinking a little bit ahead in terms of the, the design focus for the map. Several days later, I had 100 graphical files of Bentley snowflakes that I'd put through Photoshop to slightly warp to make sure they're perfectly hexagonal and slightly change their size because not all snowflakes are the same size. So I kind of messed around with the originals, but I messed around, I think, in a good way because I needed consistency for when I'm making my own, my own map. And this legend um, tells kind of the story of where I wanted to get to. I want to show snow accumulation through um, the symbol being different, full to light and wispy, but also through size, make them slightly proportional, and also modified slightly by transparency. So the design here is shape, size, transparency, three of what Betan might call visual variables that I'm going to modify to create the overall image. OK, great. Should we do some GISing? Yeah, you all said. Um, <laughs> I get paid by a GIS company. I'm going to do some GISing. So I go into ArcGIS Pro. Um, I decide I'm going to make, make a large format poster. I'm from Europe. Um, I'm from Britain. So I'm going to make them in the A series. So this is going to be an A1 size poster, which, by the way, is terrible if you're trying to get the thing framed in the US because A series isn't the standard size. I digress again. But it's 23 inches wide by 33 inches tall, which gives me a map scale of about one to one and a half million. And after a little trial and error, I settled on a hexagon. What a great use of the screen that covered 50 square kilometers, roughly 16 square miles for each hexagon. Enough for some detail, but not too generalized. And there's basically about 8,000 hexagons on the map itself. So I make a grid of hexagons. I then convert them into points, the central, central point. And I, I will not go into the detail here, but I did some GISing to uh, basically attribute all of these points with the data from National Weather Center, um, snow accumulation data. Um, and this is kind of where I think Michael used the term yesterday, expressive power comes in. I can make my computer make the map I want. It's just because I have an awful lot of uh, sort of time spent with ArcGIS Pro and before it, all the other versions to help me to understand how to turn the idea from this silly thing up here into something on, on paper or on screen. Sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes you make your fingers bleed to try to do it, but anything's possible. So after attributing, I literally hit run, and that turns into a nice patchwork of snowflakes. All 8,000 points turned into pseudo randomized organized snowflakes. You apply a little bit of emphasis through transparency and sizing, and you've now got a proportional symbol with a maximum size to the limits of the hexagon. So you put this together in a final map, and there's hardly any topographic detail, but I used a font of fluffiness. Um, I was the one that created the Chaison fonts, and that's actually off Chaison's work, but it seemed to work here as well, so reuse it. Um, that's the photograph from my front yard I showed you earlier. No copyright needed. It's mine. Um, <laughs> I also made a border of snowflakes, but I also put this map out for a little bit of critique 
to a few friends before I went with it, and one of whom is sat in here, didn't like the border, RJ. Um, <laughs> and that's fair enough, but I thought, I do. So I went, I went with it. Um, legend, various descriptors, a very subtle difference between land and water, not much other topographic detail. I filled space with a sort of a histogram, um, also taking the cue from the California Water Atlas, um, just to kind of create something visually a little bit more interesting. But I wasn't finished. I was going to a conference in Colorado, the ICA Mountain Cartography Conference, and I had this idea I wanted to make the areas over 100 inches sparkle. So I got out my knife, I made a sort of a, what do you call it, um, a sort of a stencil, I guess, uh, without cutting my fingers. Um, and then I went to the store to get some lacquer. And, and my wife comes back and I'm on the dining room table and she's like, what are you doing? So I'm spraying lacquer everywhere. Um, and if you don't mind some mild profanity, she said, that's crap. Um, but she said, I've got an idea. And she came back five minutes later with a bottle of nail polish. And so I painted the areas above 100 inches snowfall as another visual variable in nail varnish, glittery nail varnish. And again, went to, the, went to the conference. And that was some experimental sort of work I was trying to do to elevate um, a particular key part of the map, those areas above 100 inches of snowfall. I wanted to go further when I got back. Um, I needed to find a printer that was going to be able to do this properly because I can't, I'm not nail varnishing 10, 50 or 100 maps. Now, this became a mission because trying to find a printer that would put spot metallic ink through their very expensive lith lithographic press is not easy. Um, they weren't happy about the idea and they were charging considerable amount of money. But it did, make, it did mean that I could go back to sort of old school cartography and effectively make three plates for them. Um, a, a black ink, a K, um, which was going to be uh, basically printed black on white with the negative space being all of the white components. I then had a spot silver, Pantone silver um, overlay that was going to be printed on top of it, um, which also from a, a sort of a work point of view meant that I could demonstrate ArcGIS Pro's new support for Pantone color matching system. Tick, the company likes it. Okay, and then a layer for this, this UV gloss that was going to be applied afterwards and then, and then uh, fixed, to the, um, fixed to the map. Okay, found a printer through a very long process. Actually ended up being just down the road in Ontario, California. Um, sent me the proof. Um, this is where you hold your breath, because if you split your map into three plates, you don't want to make an error. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you how much it costs, but it was over $2,000 for 10 prints. I've just told you how much it cost. And the, <laughs> the proof comes around, and the guy actually said, this is one of the most interesting pieces of work that, that they've done in working with Esri for 20 years. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I go, we're getting somewhere here. Looked fantastic. Told him to run with it. He bought the finished maps round to my house himself, rather than just deliver them, ship them, or have me collect them. And they looked beautiful, I thought. Um, the snowflakes shimmered with a silvery sheen. Um, it's in some respects behind glass, you don't quite, quite get the full effect, but trust me, um, the UV gloss caught the light beautiful, and this is exactly how I wanted it to look. That interplay of black and silver and gloss, I think works quite nicely together. Um, and then I came to sign 10 copies, um, which given the cost of each was again, quite a sort of a shaky hand moment. I can't mess this up. Um, there was a lot of jeopardy involved, but I, I got through it. And I've been taking these around various conferences for, I don't know, the last three or four months um, and displaying the map um, as a vehicle, not, not to display the map, but to show the techniques and what went behind it. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, very nicely, it won an award, um, which I was thrilled about because that brings more exposure, not to necessarily the work, but to what I and other people like me are doing. But I, I just want to, a word of caution here. It won an award. Beautiful. I went back to my hotel room. I went on email. I got an email for the, from the Information is Beautiful Award saying, you've not even made the shortcut, the shortlist. 
There you go. So this is an award-winning, award-losing <laughs> map. Okay. Now then, just to sort of to sort of wrap up, that's that's where I'm at pretty much with the map. But the map is really just a tool to deliver the real content, the how-to, the blog. If you're using ArcGIS software, it's easy. It's all here. The styles can be downloaded. If you're using QGIS or something else, great. You can follow the workflow, just apply it to the tool that you are use, used to using. Um, and that's fine too, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and there's also a link to download the map if you want your own copy. I'm not going to print it for you in silver, but you can certainly print it in monochrome if you wish. But there's scope for doing other things. We could animate them. Snow, we could animate snowflakes. We could do that. How many of you like this? How many of you don't? Yeah, okay. Sometimes you leave things on your hard drive because they don't speak to you. You don't have to publish everything, okay? Edit your own content. Ask for critiques. Ask for people to look through your work um, and don't necessarily publish absolutely everything you've got. Um, and that's basically my process and my practice. And I've done it a number of different times using different binned methods. Um, in the second book I wrote, Thematic Mapping, I made mini Trumps and Clintons um, and tessellated them using um, MC Escher's basic reptile shape. And there's n I'm not making any comments, um, but you can tessellate using all sorts of shapes. We've recently had a new um, tessellated shape discovered, the aperiodic monotile, the hat, um, where there's no repetition across the surface. Um, it's called the Einstein tile. So I thought I would map Einstein bagel stores with it. It turns out that doesn't really make a very interesting map. So I did gravity anomalies instead, because there's a bit of a link to Einstein there. And as Michael mentioned it yesterday, I've done some work on Chason too. Um, and uh, to emphasize that you can do great work on modern technology, these are recreations of Chason's work in ArcGIS Pro faithful recreations. I quite often like going back in history to find great maps, Minard, Snow, um, Nightingale, Chaison. I've done them all in ArcGIS Pro with styles and techniques and workflows and things like that. Um, and there's the fonts. And last week, this is the last map, and I know I'm a couple of minutes out. I know, I know, I know. Um, I'll buy you a drink later. Maybe. Last week, I thought, let's do one for the eclipse. So I made a, another binned map of the uh, annular eclipse using um, a real sun. It's not really real, but I'm going to call it a real instead of snowflakes. Same ideas, same principles, different context, different font. Allows me to use a Pink Floyd quote all the way around the border. Um, and no, I'm not turning it into Bonnie Tyler for next year's total eclipse. I'm not doing that. Um, and so you can kind of create very, very different looking maps with exactly the same technique. And that, I think, is where modern cartography is really interesting at the moment. Taking what we know, what is established, and making new and interesting things. And hopefully along the way, helping other people um, try to make their own work a little more interesting, a little more exciting. Um, so with that, there's a link to everything I've done. A little QR code will take you to the same page. You can find everything I've done there. And thank you very much indeed.